So we can start this evening as usual with a guided meditation. So please make yourself comfortable. Ask your body how it wants to sit or stand. I always say sit, but standing meditation is a posture. <laughs> Lying down meditation is a posture. Perhaps not postures we're able to hold for quite such a long period of time, but they are available to us. Should our bodies really feel tired or sick? Or perhaps you might feel drowsy and standing can sometimes be a really great way of establishing a sense of mindfulness and presence. Perhaps not right now, but just keep it in mind for your practice. <clears throat> So there are many postures we can adopt, cross-legged, sitting on a chair, perhaps sitting on the floor, but with your legs stretched out. One of my first teachers used to sit with one leg crossed inward and one leg stretched outward because she had a bad knee on that side. You might wish to have your back self-supported so that it can establish a sense of wakefulness, uprightness. And other times if you're tired or sometimes for myself, if I have stomach issues and I feel tension in my stomach, I just like to lean back slightly onto a chair, the back of a chair on the sofa or put something in the small of my back. But see if the support can come from your spine rather than from tensing any stomach muscles or any other muscles in your body, allowing the ground, the chair, the gravity to support your weight. Maybe stretching slightly. The neck, the shoulders often feel rather tense, hunched, contracted. Making sure you're warm enough, cool enough, your clothes are loose, not tight or pinching anywhere. And that your limbs have plenty of space. I had to move my chair here so that I can give my ankles more space so they're not pressing into my shins. And this small adjustment, this sensitive care really shows our body that we are its friend. We're not regarding the body as a slave, <laughs> expecting it to serve us, but rather we serve our body at this time. giving the body a chance to really relax, restore, re-energize, and soften any tensions. any tightness or holding that's now unnecessary.
Just noticing the space, <clears throat> the silence around you. the absence of the busyness of activities of the day. Perhaps you've been socializing, driving, shopping. Cooking dinner, whatever it is, just notice how it feels when those activities come to an end. Recognizing the delight when doing busyness, controlling settles down. Now there's nothing to do but be here. And enjoy the simplicity of this moment and the next and the next. You may find your mind is still moving even though your body has stopped. Your body is still. See if you can also notice amidst or between the movements, the thinking in the mind, moments of silence. between the end of one thought and the start of the next. And just wait in that silence, wait in the moment, wait on the moment with kindness, curiosity and complete presence of mind. This is what the Buddha called establishing mindfulness as a priority. And that mindfulness increases in power and effectiveness when we add kindness. The Buddha's right intention to the way that we're aware. So we stay open and present to each experience, moment by moment. The sense of acceptance, making peace, letting go of the moment that just passed. 
and opening our heart with kindness, gentleness to each precious new moment of life. And as your mindfulness builds and increases, you may find your mind naturally inclining to a particular meditation theme. To give your mind a little more focus, a little more of a place to rest. Perhaps maintaining awareness, contact, the body and any sensations in the body. Or maybe resting your mind on the breath. And allowing everything else just to fade into the background without pushing it away. But at this moment, the breath or the sensations in your body or perhaps the cultivation of loving kindness is the most important thing in the world. And always the most important thing to do with any experience, any meditation object, even any emotion or thought is just to care.
So we're coming close to the end of this meditation. Let's take the opportunity together to spread a little loving kindness, first of all, to ourselves. So just offer yourself some goodwill, perhaps phrases of loving kindness. Such as, may I be happy, peaceful, liberated from all suffering. And see if you can allow these good wishes to really suffuse your body and mind. Then if you wish, bringing to mind all the people in this Zoom room, people whose faces you know or are new to you, and spread those thoughts of loving kindness to all of us here. May we all be happy, be safe and well. May we all find deep contentment and peace. And be liberated. <clears throat> completely liberated from all suffering. May all beings everywhere, human beings, non-human beings, visible or invisible beings, all beings, those whom we know and like, who are strangers to us or who we have difficulties with. May they all find true peace of mind May they all be free from suffering. Notice whatever peace, contentment, harmony has developed in your mind. See if you can stay connected to that peace, relaxation. As you 
Gently open your eyes. Today it's no bell silence. That's a terrible joke from the John Brown, <laughs> who dislikes bells. So today I have no bell. <laughs> so it's no bell silence. That went really quickly. I realised when I closed my eyes that it's really silent in this place, much more so than Oxford, actually. Even though my house was quiet over there, or the Vihara, we should say, was quiet over there, but uh, for a city. But this is so quiet, there's this sort of ringing sound and just a few little bird sounds that sometimes pierce that sort of vibrational ringing hum in the, in the atmosphere. <laughs> it's really nice, actually, I want to go deeper. So I'm sure that with the support of this community and all the goodness we've generated together, that will soon be able to happen, which is great. So this evening, I wasn't really planning to give a talk, um, but a little theme occurred to me and I just wanted to speak on that for 10 minutes or so. Um, and it's just, you know, my own experience right now, moving from Oxford, as I mentioned, from our first Bikuni Vihara that we've developed over here in the West to um, a place in rural Wiltshire for the rains retreat. And we're renting this place just for that one purpose so that I can have some solitude, some quiet time and time to deepen my meditation so that I can uh, serve the community and um, hopefully be able to speak from a deeper place of Dhamma than if I were to neglect my practice, of course, which is never the Buddha's uh, advice. You know, he, he makes it very clear that to uh, protect others, we must protect oneself. To really serve for the benefit of others, we must know our own benefit, how to cultivate our own happiness, our own um, goodness, our own inner peace, and then we have a lot more to share. So the theme that really occurred to me now is just that theme of solitude and what solitude really means. Because in Buddhism, we have two kinds of solitude and the word is viveka, the Pali word viveka. And uh, it's actually one of the words that is described for the bliss of the jhana. The jhana is paviveka sukha. So the jhana states, deep states of samadhi are known as states of um, paviveka, it means like complete seclusion, secluded from the sensual world, secluded even from the five hindrances and the five senses themselves. But that would be in the category of what he called chitta viveka, mental seclusion. And the Buddha also talked about kaya viveka, physical seclusion, seclusion of the body, and that is what I'm experiencing right now, being secluded from the city, secluded from so much traffic on the streets, secluded even from you know, people that I know who live nearby and who I do see from time to time. And I think when I first arrived here a few days ago, um, it was quite striking and there was a sense of um, slight trepidation and even a slight feeling of disorientation from being settled in one place and finding my roots in one place to suddenly being in the middle of rural countryside that I have no particular connection with, you know. And so the change from being integrated to being in physical solitude was quite striking and profound. And it takes a while to settle into that. But what I'm starting to notice now is that to that I'm enjoying the seclusion and also wanting to deepen it. So for example, in this um, place that we're renting, because it's not going to be a long-term base, um, whereas Oxford was a much longer term base, I could tidy everything up, I could sort of take down all the pictures from the walls. Here there's actually much more happening, like jazzy curtains and pictures and you know, items from the people who rent this place. And I see this kind of wish to start to clear away things, to simplify things more and more and more. 
So I uh, angled my computer this evening so that you won't see the jazzy curtains, but they're very cute. They've got animals and elephants and deer and trees and lots of different colors. But it's interesting that when the mind starts to get that taste for peace, that taste for simplicity, it just resonates with something much more simple, much more calming for the mind. And so I feel that this is all part of the preparation, you know, part of the kind of emptying out of busyness, not only of actual activities, but also like the visual reminders around me. And I think it can be really helpful to think of things such as symbols or images or even ritual as something that helps reminders of solitude, reminders of simplicity, rather than something to clutter the mind. So I'm trying to kind of create areas that are empty you know, places that don't have anything on the walls, places that I can remove the mats, which is sort of jazzy and, and patterned and put much plainer things down. And that all helps to have this sense of physical seclusion and also calming of that sensual world. So there's not as much for the eye to kind of grasp, you know, and as it says in sense restraint, sense restraint is like, um, noticing the signs and features of things and then not grasping on those. So when there's nothing much to look at, when there's nothing much to hear, those senses start to turn inward and we start to move towards mental seclusion as well. Yeah. So it can be really nice, like I tried to sort of um, start off this meditation by noticing the things you've left behind. And this is one of the practices of emptiness that the Buddha teaches in the Chula Sunyata Sutta, in the Majjhima Nikaya, I forget the number. There's a Chula and a Maha Sunyata Sutta, the shorter and the longer one. And they start by someone going to the forest and recognizing that this forest is empty of the city, it's empty of villages, it's empty of noise, right? And we recognize that as a thing it's empty of something, but the emptiness in itself is something very pleasant, something very conducive to the practice that we can really appreciate. Yeah, I remember Ajahn Brahm gave this lovely quote once. He said, um, nothing is what's not really there. Emptiness is what you can really appreciate. There's a difference. Emptiness has a certain flavor, a certain taste of renunciation, a certain taste of peace. And so I'm starting to really appreciate that here. And of course, with the practice, I will be going more and more inward and starting to empty the mind. So we can start to see, you know, when we practice that at first the mind's still full of our impressions of the day, you know, thoughts about the outside world, thoughts about the sights, sounds, smell, tastes, and touches we may have experienced in our life or in that day. And after a while, even that thinking mind starts to slow down, starts to settle and calm. And it, between those thoughts, there are gaps, there are spaces, there is silence in the mind. And it takes a little bit of practice to get a taste for that. At first, it can be a little bit intimidating for some people because it can feel like a void. But I think, you know, when we consider that solitude, viveka, is kind of distancing ourselves from busyness, maybe physically at first, and then distancing ourselves from our mental world. It's not a distance that should be cold or rejecting, but rather when we notice that distance, when we're able to see that there's a space between our mind and its contents, for example, we're able to put something beautiful in between. So we fill up that space with kindness. We can fill up that space with a sense of making peace. You know, we can actually add a sense of friendliness, compassion, in that space between the knower and the known, the mind and its objects, yeah. So then this solitude doesn't feel lonely, it doesn't feel aloof or cold, it actually can feel like something that connects us, yeah, something that makes us feel closer to ourselves and even closer to others. So ironically, you know, even though I'm going to be on retreat now for four months and I won't actually see any of you, I know that you'll still be present in my mind and I know that you know, when that image or that memory of a person comes up, there is a space between us, but in that space, I can add that kindness and warmth. And this is what the Buddha talked about as the wise way of relating to the world, yeah? the second factor of the noble path, the intentions, the attitudes, the way of looking that is uh, a way of making peace, renunciation, letting go, non-control, just allowing things to be, a way of gentleness, Again, just treating our inner world 
our thoughts and emotions, our breath, our sensations, the thoughts in our mind with kindness, with gentleness, not with control, not with cruelty or violence. You don't belong, but with a sense of gentleness, just holding things lightly, holding things kindly in our mind. And also with this loving kindness, an attitude of metta, of opening our hearts to all of life. And then the solitude starts to feel really vast because we have less and less in our mind, less and less of the clutter and the things we don't need that mind can fill up with the Brahma Viharas. So sometimes people think that when you're enlightened or when you're like really developed on the path, how do you actually live if there's no craving, if there's no wanting, if there's no anger, where's the motivation to do anything at all? And the answer is that, you know, those craving and aversion are not the only motivations of mind. They're just very coarse kind of sankharas. They're very coarse defilements that actually get us very entangled in life and entangled in difficult, complex relationships and situations. But when those things start to settle, they're not replaced with nothing. They're replaced with this beautiful sense of emptiness, spaciousness, freedom of mind. And that gives space for these Brahma Viharas to really arise and become the motivation of our mind. So people who you know, are free from craving and ill will actually run on these Brahma Viharas. There's no other reason for them to get up and start doing things in the world. There's nothing they want for themselves. But they just you know, practice and, and serve out of compassion, anukampa, out of compassion for the world, for the good and benefit of all beings, just because that's their very nature now. It becomes impossible to stop. Many people are saying that Ajahn Brahm should retire. He's nearly 70 now, and it's surely time for him to stop serving. But one uh, story that I think is not completely private because it's going around in Perth, but uh, he went to see a teacher in Thailand called Ajahn Gunha, who is, I think, Ajahn Chah's nephew or a kind of second nephew or something like that. He looks quite similar to Ajahn Chah, but he's much rounder and more kind of chubby and sort of chuckly than I imagine Ajahn Chah might have been, but they do look quite similar. And he's reputed to be, um, who knows, but very far on the path, yeah, at least uh, some kind of area we never really know. And I actually think it's slightly distasteful to talk about people in terms of attainments. But anyway, suffice it to say, he's a very wise and, you know, metaphor monk. And um, he, Ajahn Brahm went to him and said, you know, some of my disciples say that I should stop serving because I'm getting old and, you know, I should take a rest. And this uh, great monk said to Ajahn Brahm, he said, if you stop serving, you'll die. And I thought that was so inspiring because really what would be the purpose of his life if there's nothing much that Ajahn Brahm wants anymore? In fact, I would say nothing at all. Then why would he be here if it wasn't for helping others, if it wasn't for teaching the Dhamma? Isn't that just so beautiful? <laughs> So I just wanted to reflect a little bit on that because this is sort of what I'm getting inspired about right now, thinking of going to retreat, going into retreat. And uh, I also want to really thank the community for allowing me this opportunity because I know that obviously you wouldn't make any demands that I teach you every week or anything like that. And I do it for the love of the Dhamma, you know. I was saying to someone recently that uh, sometimes I wonder if I should keep doing that even during my retreat just because it brings me so much joy. But at the same time, that would be re-engaging with the world and it would bring me sort of a little bit to the surface of the mind again. And it's just really beautiful to know that everybody here, although you enjoy receiving the teachings and coming to the community more regularly, you also understand that you know, all of this is only possible due to the practice. And the deeper each one of us proceeds on this path, you know, the more solitude that we start to um, allow into our lives. Even if you don't have such a privilege as to do a long retreat, we can always find that solitude. We can always find that quiet time just to check in with ourselves, to recenter ourselves, to reestablish a beautiful intention and uh, attitude to our lives you know, and really make the Dhamma the most important thing that we center everything else around. You know, 
there's no need to worry about whether you're busy or whether you're less busy, because at any time, if you align what you're doing with the Eightfold Path, you are practicing one or more of those factors. You know, whether it's your livelihood, right livelihood, I hope, no dealing of drugs or selling alcohol, hopefully. But that also can refine as you practice, you know. And then it becomes a part of the path. And of course, along with that, when you engage with others, you'll be speaking and you'll be able to learn how to use your speech in a way that harmonizes, way that, ways that soothe divisions, sometimes ways that do establish boundaries and do have to say, this is not okay, but we do it with kindness, without judgment and out of a sense of self-compassion and care. Yeah, so we use our speech in ways that is wise and that looks for the greater good. And also, of course, whenever you do get time to practice, you can just find a little space in your home where you go to maybe only for meditation that is secluded. So you can have that Kaya Viveka. You can be away from others. You know you won't be disturbed. And you can just have that one little place in your house, even if it's just the corner of a room, and put your cushion there, maybe put a little shrine there or some little things that mean something to you, maybe a pebble or a stone, a shell, whatever it may be. Yeah, I have this beautiful Patachara statue behind me. <laughs> you might also have a little Buddha statue or Kuan Yin or something that, you know, speaks to you. And, and whenever you go there, you use that place just for meditation, just for making peace with whatever arises in your mind. So when you meditate, it's important to establish mindfulness, as we discussed, allow the mind to start settling, coming into the present, building in strength, you know, resting in the moment. But really, whether you turn that mind, that mindfulness towards the breath or the body or any other meditation theme, that is not as important. The theme is not as important as the, as the way you are aware. So whenever you can be kind, whenever you can care for the moment, you are on the path, you are meditating, you're practicing right intention, right motivation. And that is where you're changing your karma. That's where karma is made at the level of intention, the level of volition. Yeah. And as a result, things will start to shift. The negativities won't remain in your mind for very long. You know, if anger comes up and you're kind to it, oh, poor thing, you know, I see that you're angry. Never mind, you can be there. You're just like kind of a grumpy person. You can even kind of um, anthropomorphize that anger. Imagine it like a scruffy being with kind of fangs or something and treat it with a bit of kindness and, you know, humor. And don't worry so much about it. And really that anger won't last so long. <laughs> so always make the practice about the way you're aware, the way you're relating to the mind and to the world. And after a while, when you're not fueling it anymore with anger, with ill will, with craving, clinging, naturally things start to fade. So from viveka, you know, from turning away, from seclusion, things start to fade. We get this beautiful sense of dispassion. You know, we start to get a taste for simplicity, solitude, freedom. And we start to have dispassion towards agitating things in this world. And when we're not so interested, we're not fueling, you know, the contact between our senses and those um, objects in the world or those thoughts in our mind, they do start to fade naturally. We just don't invest them with so much interest, with so much value anymore. So they start to fade and as things fade, gradually they cease. They drop away from our conscious awareness. We start to notice the ending of things and the joy of those endings, the bliss of things settling down, the bliss of silence, the bliss of solitude. So I will be taking you somehow into my solitude. And in that solitude, I'm sure that I'm going to feel more connected to everyone in this community, especially those who I've come to know fairly well and have worked with. And, you know, you'll all be with me in my heart. And it's just so beautiful to me that the more connected with myself I feel, the more connected I feel with everyone else. And I think it's just something about getting in contact with the essence of what it means to be human, what it means to be on the path, you know, that beautiful um, heartfelt compassion and benevolence that's such a part of the human nature, I do believe. So thank you once again 
for all your support and I would like to offer some opportunities for discussion, questions, feedback, especially because this is the, our last evening together and uh, I am a little tired so um, it would be really nice to hear from you and also have the chance to clarify any doubts or anything maybe that's bothering you, that's on your mind, and it doesn't have to be related to retreats or solitude or anything like that. So please uh, just share if you wish. And you can do that by raising your virtual hand. Someone has a question in the box, Susie, but I didn't see the question just yet. Do you want to be unmuted? You won't be recorded. Your voice will be recorded though, but not your video. Otherwise, if that's not comfortable for you, please feel free to write it in the box. Uh, if you would like to ask in person, you can raise your hand. Okay, great. And don't worry about being shy. I'm also shy, but I had no choice. <laughs> So for those who are shy and have a choice, I totally respect that choice. So the question is, would I encourage lay people to practice the eight precepts? I would say that it's a very case by case thing. Um, it might be interesting to see, first of all, why that is of interest to you, where you're coming from with that. Um, is it going to be helpful for restraint or is it going to be a little bit hard on you? Like, is it going to be something that really supports your practice? Or is it something that's coming more from an ideology that by practicing eight precepts, you know, somehow you will be a better Buddhist? So I would say, I mean, the most uh, difficult of the eight precepts is most probably um, not eating after 12 or not eating after one in the British summertime, at least. Um, and so I think that very much depends on your health and the kind of livelihood you have, the kind of work and demands on your energy. Um, again, I was talking with a friend today and saying that uh, I found it was fairly easy to observe eight precepts as a lay person because I used to live in meditation centers most of the time and uh, serve retreats. And sometimes if I was serving, I'd have something very light in the evening. But of course, if I was sitting retreats, which I did a lot of, I would be on eight precepts. And my Physical health was absolutely great. But when I actually ordained and I wasn't really having enough nutrition because of the environment I was in, I started to get really quite sick. And I know that for some people, it can be really challenging longer term. Um, I was able to manage that because I was meditating so much. But sometimes when I'm really busy and I've got a big workload, it can be quite difficult. So I would say really see whether that's going to be supportive both physically and mentally. Um, but certainly try it out. One of the practices that's common in Buddhist countries is to do that on the oppositor days. So on the fortnightly days, the full moon day and the no moon day of each month. And that's when most Buddhist monastics, um, Buddhist lay people, sorry, would, would come to the monastery to do that. And they would formally take the eight precepts in the morning. Although you don't need to do that, um, you can take the eight precepts yourself. Um, if you wish, you can even take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha and then um, take the eight precepts, you know, look it up online, get the Pali version, get the English version, choose which one you'd like to repeat. Maybe something that you understand is good and, uh, and try it for a day, you know, so see how it goes. And uh, I do know one lay person who is uh, hoping to ordain and they already observe eight precepts since about a year. Um, they've made some adaptations to their diet so that they eat a bit more at lunchtime and they're doing pretty well. So see how it goes. Yeah. Certainly, I think it's nice to simplify in terms of uh, jewelry and makeup and all that kind of stuff as well, because really it's just uh, they call it makeup for a reason, right? You're making something up. It's not really real. It's kind of a facade. So it can be really nice to just start to. Uh, let go of those kind of things and that can also turn you a little bit more into the inner world. Any more questions or comments?
I'll read something here that Jacob's written in the chat box. He said he asked about practice in the higher realms on Friday and then found a sutta that complements what I said. He just wanted to share because he found it so beautiful. So this is the quote. Those, however, who attend on the holy ones and those whose faith oops, in the fortunate one, that's the Buddha, is deeply rooted and well-established go to the world of the devas or are born here in a good family. Advancing in successive steps, those wise ones attain Nibbana. That's great. So just for the background on that, the question on Friday at the Sutta class was whether or not the deva realm is a good place to be reborn or whether um, it's better to be reborn as a human being and whether we can get enlightened from those deva realms. So this Sutta would seem to suggest that indeed we can, and that it is an outcome, that kind of rebirth, either as a human in a good family or someone in the realm of the devas, the higher realms, um, can be an outcome of faith in the blessed one, faith that's deeply rooted and well-established. And of course, many other good qualities as well, generosity, virtue, um, loving kindness, um, non-ill will, all the opposites, patience, all these qualities are going to give us good rebirths. And especially, as I say, purifying our motivation, purifying our mind. So we really don't need to worry. All we can do is take care of this moment and our attitudes right now and have a bit of trust that you, if your intention is good, things will turn out okay in the end. You're all very quiet today. <laughs> Diana. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to thank you so much for everything you've given to us over all these past many months when you weren't on your rains retreat. <laughs> and I know I'm not alone. I'm going to miss you a lot. Um, Oh, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Yeah, I'm going to miss all of you as well. And um, yeah, there will still be some sessions. So do look it up on our website and in our newsletter. We'll be having um, talks from some other bikunis who are also really wonderful bikunis with a lot to share. And uh, that will be on the first Sunday of each month starting in July and also the peer led sessions. So you can still listen to a little talk probably by me or by Ajahn Brahm or maybe one of the other bikinis on there on our YouTube channel. And uh, listen to that as a community, do some meditation as a community and then have a little bit of discussion together. And it can be a really lovely way of keeping the pot warm, so to speak, and also supporting each other because this community is not only supportive in a Dhamma friendship kind of way, we're also working towards something really incredible. We're working towards establishing a monastery. And for that, we need strong connections. We need to have ideas generated. We need to work as a team. And so I think it's very special and something that, you know, I would really invite everybody to be a part of because it will help you add that extra element of service also into your practice. You know, when we feel we're working for a common aim and we're doing something of lasting benefit in the world, it's really motivating. It makes sense of why we meditate because then you've got something to put those benefits of your meditation directly into in a way that can support others on their path as well. So when we can establish a monastery that's more permanent than the place I had before, it's going to be a real sanctuary of spiritual friendship. You know, it's going to be a place that you can come and visit anytime. And even if you don't connect with me personally, you can connect with each other, you know, or if you do connect with the teachings that I can offer, then you know where to find me, you know? So there's a little bit of continuity there. And I think there's something beautiful about having longer term relationships with our spiritual friends, rather than just listening to a talk online once in a while, but never really being able to relate in a personal way. I know that for me, you know, having that ongoing contact and relationship and a deep sort of trusting, loyal relationship with my teacher is just incredibly supportive because he knows me and I don't have to explain anything very much at all. 
you know if I say something he knows whether you know I'm maybe uh maybe it's very serious or it's just a passing whim you know it, it's like I might be worried about myself at, at times but he won't be or maybe he needs to be you know and I can check in about that so these are really wonderful benefits of having spiritual friendship and uh, people who are kind who can help nudge us onto the right path when we're veering off um, in gentle ways in ways that encourage us rather than criticizes us and also of course rejoice in our successes too because over time we may not always notice that we're changing that our practice is deepening we are growing in wholesome states you know we have such a tendency to see the bits which are still to be done <laughs> the bits where we're still lacking we're still not wise we still react but other people can see that there's a change and then having that positive reflection that positive feedback can be incredibly encouraging on our paths so i do encourage you to stay connected to each other but anyway i'll be back and as i said um i think that these zoom sessions are so inspiring precisely because they bring people together from around the world not only that but some people don't have the opportunity to physically travel to a retreat center or to sit on an intensive retreat, but they can do that from the comfort of their home. And I think, you know, in order to include people who have different abilities, physical abilities, um, it's really a beautiful gift to offer these sessions online. Yeah. And of course we have Ajahn Brahm's retreat as well coming up in December. It's quite a long time still, but I do encourage you to apply if you wish. Um, and what else? Lots and lots of things. So there'll be lots of support. And remember, you know, sometimes, even for myself, sometimes I can get distracted thinking, I need this support, or I need to listen to this talk. And sometimes Ajahn Brahm says to me, you know, you know so much already. Now just go and experience it. You know, it's all in there. Let it kind of work. Another wonderful teacher who Diana and myself actually share, Venerable Ujagara, he's a French Canadian monk trained in um, Sri Lanka initially and then Myanmar and he's been a monk since 1979 so another great great teacher very pure-hearted being with a lot of wisdom and humility and he uh, said to me last year I think before I went to my retreat he said uh, it's like the samadhi I'm not going to remember it properly now which is a shame but um, something about the wisdom you know, that you learn from Dhamma talks from teachers needs the samadhi in order to really take deep roots in the mind. So it's like the samadhi is the fertile soil, which those seeds can really start to take root in. So we need that silence, that stillness in the mind to allow some of these things to deepen and to grow. Just always having input, input, input is also not necessarily completely helpful. So sometimes we have to take that step into the unknown, have a little bit more time to meet with ourselves, to feel the loneliness, to feel perhaps a sense of missing or you know, being a little bit isolated from community, to open that space and see what's inside it. See if you can make peace with it. See if you can befriend that too. And allow the mind to still, allow what you know to take root. Trust that it will. Oh. so there's a long message here with a lot of gratitude and a question at the end so I'll probably just read the whole thing even though I'm a bit reluctant to read out phrase <laughs> but it's just a nice message and I think it leads into the question so dear Venchanda first of all many thanks for all the opportunities of practice you've provided in the past months for all of us in the past week, it's happened that some friends were in need and the words of yourself, Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahmali and other good friends just came out at the right time. I also noticed that sometimes there are very interesting coincidences that tend to help in helping people and in the practice. Question, do people get used to these coincidences? Get used to, I'm not quite sure what you mean by get used to them. Thank you very much for all that you offer and do and all the best with your retreat. Very interesting coincidences that tend to help in helping people and in the practice. Do people get used to these coincidences? Hmm, interesting question. As I say, I'm not quite sure what you mean, 
But I guess what it seems to say to me is that you might be sensing that there can be a kind of flow that we get into. So we're on a certain track with our life. Perhaps we're on a good path and we're becoming more attuned to the way things seem to work. That if we have good intentions, often those intentions do yield beneficial effects. And if we, for example, ask for help or give help to others, that help comes back to us. And sometimes in unexpected ways that we, uh, because again, if we're pure hearted, we don't have so much expectation. So it may be that we're more receptive to that as well, more grateful for that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, when I lived in India, um, I just went out there with 200 pounds and a one-way ticket when I was 19 years old. And I mean, it was incredibly serendipitous, the kind of things that happened to me to basically help me live there. I, I lived there for the next seven years of my life. And it was amazing how you'd keep meeting the same people in different places on the path, you know, just at the right time. And then they'd tell you about this opportunity for retreat or this opportunity to earn a little bit of money so that I could actually um, leave India and then do a little traveler's job and come back again. And it seemed to happen almost all the time to the point that I became very confident, actually. Always a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of sort of, ooh, not sure what's going to happen next. But I very much felt that because things would fall into place, it sort of gave me confidence that I was on the right path. And I knew that in a sense, yeah, I found my groove in life, you know, things seem to fall into place. And so, yeah, I don't know if I got used to it or not, but I certainly felt quite safe in the insecurity, you know, quite at ease with uncertainty because things kept working out. And I kind of also knew that even if they wouldn't, I'd be able to cope because as I was developing in Dhamma, the mind was becoming more strong, more resilient, more fearless. I remember saying to uh, someone that, uh, or thinking to myself that, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ordain, right? And I, I think, well, what if I never get the chance? Or what if by putting everything into the Dhamma and not making any provisions for a fallback plan, what if I end up with nothing, you know, just with no money, with no, obviously no pension, no career to fall back on or anything. And I remember thinking it won't matter because if I keep practicing, I'll be free from that fear. There won't be fear, you know? And actually at that time in Asia, I thought, well, anyway, I want to ordain. So there are monasteries, there are monasteries in Asia. I can, I can ordain and I'll find contentment there. The bit that I didn't bargain for was getting so sick that I'd have to leave Asia and find a completely new monastic life elsewhere in the world. And that has been a challenge. But even then, you can look at the challenges and think, gosh, this is impossible. Or you can look at all the things that are in place to make it actually possible, you know, to continue to proceed. And really, I think it just comes down to each and every step. If I think, right, we've got to make a monastery, it's going to be a big place, it's going to cost a lot of funds that we don't actually have, you know, we're maybe two thirds of the way there and it's five and a half years now and I don't know how many more years I can do this, then, you know, it can be quite overwhelming. But when we just focus on this step and we see how much goodness has been generated now and also um, sometimes I ask myself if this was it, if I had to die now, how would I feel? I know that I would feel absolutely satisfied with the efforts that I've done, with the intentions, the, you know, trying to do my best, not always succeeding, but my intention has been good. And I know I couldn't really have any regrets, you know? So I might feel different if I didn't have opportunities for long retreat, because I do feel that, you know, I'm a, I love meditation. It's something my mind, my heart leaps towards. And sometimes it's very hard to, uh, have so little time in my daily life you know sometimes it is two hours at the most and even as a lay person I had much more than that so sometimes it can be difficult but at the same time as I say and I'm speaking from my own busy life experience we can still recognize that what we're doing in the physical world is part of the path you know if you're doing something that serves others reflect on that Again, I was speaking to a friend recently and they were saying that they sponsor this child in Cambodia. But it's nothing, you know, it's nothing. It's just one child. I said, but this child's life is completely transformed by that. I mean, that's a whole life for that child. That is her whole life that's been transformed. That's powerful. You know, we can do things for others and we should reflect on those things that we do because it's really incredible 
how one little act of kindness, even smaller than that, can have huge ripple effects. So yes, have, yeah. Um, I do think that so-called coincidences are very wonderful when we recognize them and, you know, don't take them for granted, don't be complacent, but just keep on doing good and I think you will get support. After I came here, um, Ajahn Brahm actually reminded me to uh, send some metta to the devas because there are invisible beings as well that want to support us and we don't always really acknowledge that, we don't necessarily really, you know, think or respect the fact that they could be here, right? <laughs> they could be here. And uh, even if they're not, isn't it beautiful to think that you're caring for beings even that you don't see? You know, you're caring for life even if you can't see it or benefit directly from it as far as you know, but it's good to care. Why not? So don't take things for granted. Keep on practicing the path. And if that's totally off track of what you're actually meant to ask, please ask me something else. <laughs> Okay, Susie, yes. Take care. It was nice to have you here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, thank you for the little kind messages that are coming in. Okay, so that answer made sense. That's very good. Great. So are there any more questions or things to share? Is there anyone here who is going to try the meta meditation while I'm away? Yay, excellent, excellent, excellent. Because we talked about that a little bit in the last few sessions about how we could make that our daily practice, part of our daily practice. And maybe even, you know, for some people, you might feel that you want to do that as a basis of the practice, you know, the Buddha says, when one makes it a basis, consolidates the practice of metta, makes it one's vehicle, um, it has great effects, great effects. And from those states of loving kindness or compassion, from the Brahma Vihara states, especially if you can take them as far as the jhanas into deep states of stillness, you do have a chance to generate the wisdom as a result of that, the wisdom into seeing things as they are. <laughs> I'm getting lots of really sweet messages here, which is lovely. And I'm wondering, would it be nice to just hang out for 10 minutes or would it be nice to have some little groups? We've only got 10 minutes left, but I'm thinking to maybe give you the chance to connect to each other in small groups, if you wish. Anybody, yay or nay? Yeah, not a lot of uptake, a few people uptake. So let's give it a go. And uh, we'll do that just for maybe eight minutes. How about that? And then we'll have five minutes to connect again. So what we're going to do now, and please uh, stay only if you wish, <laughs> but I would encourage you to give it a go, especially because it's our last session together now and it can help you to connect together as well, is uh, you're just going to be in groups of three or four people and just speak anything that comes from your heart and take it in turn. So one of you is speaking and you can practice right speech, you know, just listening, speaking from the heart. If anything comes up, if nothing comes up, that's perfectly fine. And the others practice right listening, just listening from the heart without judgment, just holding space. Okay. And then you can take turns with that and we'll see you back here in about eight minutes or so. So you'll have about two minutes each to just share a little bit of yourself, whatever you wish. So do give it a go if you can. You'll get a message inviting you to a room. You can just say join. If you really feel it's not the right time for you, you're too shy or whatever it may be, you can just stay back and we'll see you in the main room in 10 minutes, eight minutes. 